Welcome to season two of Witchlit, a space to talk about the craft of writing and writing the craft. I'm your host, Victoria Rashke, author, publisher, witch, and nosy Scorpio. My guests today are Irene Glass and Kane Dreamwalker, the co-founders and instructors of Black Feather Mystery School and co-authors of Black Feather Mystery School, The Magpie Training. Irene is a mystic witch, ordained minister, blogger, yoga teacher, musician with Revel Moon, Cassandra Syndrome, In Bulk Fire, and Kindred Crow, and a former Marine with a background in journalism. She's a longtime teacher of witchcraft, meditation, and magic in the Mid-Atlantic. She's performed, taught workshops, and led rituals at many festivals and conferences over the years, including, but not limited to the Sacred Space Conference, Earth Spirits, Twilight, Covening, and Rites of Spring, Fertile Ground Gathering, the Shenandoah Midsummer Festival, and more. Kane Dreamwalker, once an officer in a prison, is now a sworn priest of the Morrigan who walks a path of primal magic. A massage therapist and spirit worker, Kane's life is dedicated wholly to the practice of healing arts. A true believer of the power of our primal nature, Kane seeks constantly to explore and refine techniques that encourage healing, growth, and connection by way of tapping directly into those things that are raw, untamed, and powerful. Irene and Kane, welcome to Witchlet. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. I'm excited to have you all on. (laughs) Great. Um, This is the first time I've interviewed two authors at a time. So we uh, will probably learn a little bit as we do this. (laughs) So I hope listeners will forgive us a little bit if we wind up talking over each other occasionally. Um, But there is a transcript for anybody who needs one. We do post those (laughs) on the website. So Um, the first question, because we're a podcast about writing, I ask everyone is why write and Irene, let's start with you and then we'll ask, have Kane answer that. Sure thing. I know for me, writing and the teaching that kind of comes out of writing is this overwhelming desire to communicate. It's almost a compulsive behavior. Uh, I was in like the literary society when I was a teenager and helped publish the high school's poetry newsletter. I write a weekly blog. I just have this desperate desire to connect with people. And for me, the written word is one of the best ways to do that. I was a voracious reader as a child, which is probably not a surprise to anybody listening to the podcast right now. I'm sure we're all in that awesome club. Um, And I think it just became Came the gateway to so much for me. So this idea that there's this, this passageway that exists and that if you just put words down in the correct order, you can convey something from your heart to someone else's. I mean, who wouldn't want to do that, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and Kate, what about you? Now, how are you going to make me follow that up? Like, that's not cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so for me, this is kind of going to be a two-parter. So the first part, because I'm really wordy, uh, <laughs> like that's kind of the answer. I just like to word. Um, and I, ever since I was a little kid, uh, I would, I, I loved creative writing and, uh, you know, anytime that there was like a writing prompt, uh, you know, in, in, in from elementary school all the way through, I was always super excited to just like, write and like pour words out and and let my thoughts and imagination and opinion and whatnot kind of blossom into the world around me uh and so then the second part is for this particular project the reason why i wanted to get involved with with this project was because it was going to be a really awesome challenge for me to take like almost a decade worth of experience at that time and compile it into something that wasn't the absolute like chaos that got me to that point of my spiritual path where like I had learned things that were far beyond what I should have learned in the beginning and didn't learn the basics until later on. And like, there was a lot of, a a lot of like, wow, I wish I had known that. And so, so I, I, it was an opportunity and a challenge to sit down and think about if I could have gone back in time and, and retaught myself, how would I do that? And what would it sound like? And, and in what order would I teach myself these things? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I thought that I, I've really enjoyed that part of the book and thinking about 
kind of the transition through skills and ideas. Um, so when you're collaborating on a book like this, because obviously both are kind of coming to that, like how, what order do we want these things to be in? How did you make those decisions about what that order looked like? Cause I assume it is probably pretty universal, but not a hundred percent. Like everybody's going to have a, a few differing ideas about what comes first. Oh yes. Um, we sat down. So for each level, sorry, let me try that with full sentences one more time. <laughs> Black Father Mystery School is in its third year now. Uh, and the book that is coming out is the year one level of training. And before each level, Kane and I sit down and we actually have a very lengthy conversation about all of the material we want to cover. And then we figure out how it all put, like how it fits together simply because like for the magpie training, before we get into a lot of the spirit work stuff, I wanted to have a very strong foundation of protection magic already laid so that people knew how to do journey work very, very safely. And so there's a lot of conversation between Kane and I of going, okay, so does this come first or does this come first? Or, you know, how do we stack these things together so that they make the most sense and in a way that keeps the practitioner the most supported, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and if I could just add real quick, I uh, I think that one of the things that drives um, our our selection of order is always keeping in mind uh, that what Irene kind of hinted at a little bit, the idea of safety for practitioners, where making sure that we teach the skills that they need to learn to keep them safe first before we teach them the skills that they could potentially run into problematic stuff with. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's, that's the thing that I ran into in my, that I was talking about earlier in my own path where I learned things that I shouldn't have learned uh, <laughs> early on. Uh, and, and I, there, there were a lot of ways that I, I uh, kind of ended up banging my head against the wall. And, and so anytime that we, we set that order out, we make sure that we have those building blocks in a way that it all kind of culminates into uh, this this safe and whole practice. Mm -hmm. Kane and I are also both members of Kindred Crow, so we work together as musicians as well. And one of the nice things about that is that, you know, we're 10 years apart in age, but we, we get along well and we're used to the ability to give and receive feedback, we communicate well, like we've always been on the same team, you know, air quotes. So that I think helps a lot and that Kane can tell me, you know, I don't think that goes there. And then I'll go, oh, you know, you're probably right. And it's, <laughs> it's very, it's not contentious at all. Like, I think for us, this is just a grand adventure and we're having a lot of fun creating the witch school we wish we'd gone to. <laughs> that makes sense. And so I guess this seems like, a lot of kind of beginner witchcraft or Wicca or, you know, whichever umbrella they happen to be under kind of comes out of a tradition, but not all of those traditions necessarily are going to share their book. So what was the decision to go from? We want to have this in-person witchcraft school that we wanted to wish into, you know, being 20 years ago or whatever to let's put this in a book and put it out in the bigger world. So what, what, how did that happen? So the funny thing with black feather is that the entire thing showed up as a vision at once, all at once while I was walking my dogs and it included a book. Um, the idea was always to create part of why we wanted to create a mystery school, as opposed to a traditions. We wanted something that people could enter easily with no, no requirements and no swearing of oaths and none of the power dynamics that can be so unhealthy. I come out of Wicca and there's a reason I'm not in it anymore. Like, we wanted to create a system that is safe for people to enter into. And as I was turning over and over this idea of how to answer this call that the gods had placed to me, the whole concept of Black Feather arrived all at once. Like I even still have the Facebook post of my like epiphany of like, oh my God, you guys, here's what I'm, I'm this is what I'm going to do, you know? And so it, it all came together. So the idea for the classes was always that there would be a book. And it's part of why Kane and I begin, like the classes have comprehensive notes, which then eventually become the book. They obviously get retooled for a distance learning audience, but we start off from the perspective that everything we teach will be, will be codified at some point. <laughs> And did you want to add anything to that one? Uh, uh, no, I mean that's the, <laughs> the, the it, it never it never didn't uh, 
it, it was like never not a part of the of the scheme, uh, you know, because it, we what we can accomplish in in person, you know, it, locally in our area is one thing, but but the 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 idea of being able to disseminate that as far and as wide as we possibly can, um, like using a book is is was just the the logical step for us. Mm-hmm. No, that makes sense to you. Um, so you know, this is a book from the beginning. So how do you actually get it published? What did that look like? I, that one was fun. <laughs> oh, and when does it actually so, come out? When does the book so actually... it comes? It comes out on May the fourth. Okay. With you because I'm a nerd, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and my choice was my original choice was May the second, and I was like, could we do the fourth instead? <laughs> And my nice. publisher, thank heavens, is tolerant of our shenanigans. So it's going to be May the 4th this year. Um, so I completely wrote the manuscript first. This was my pandemic project. Um, I am a dyed-in-the-wool extrovert. Kane is as well. It's part of why we teach and why we perform. And for me, the pandemic as a result and the social isolation that was necessary was absolutely soul-crushing. So a friend and I basically were like, okay, we're going to write our books this year. Let's get through this. And over the course of the year, I lost my father. Like Creating the book was one of the few things that kind of got me through that year. I had something that I was doing every week, and it was you know completing one chapter or whatever pro phase of work was happening at that moment. Um, To get it published, I sent it to Llewellyn first, and they sent me the nicest rejection letter I've ever gotten. Um, They apparently, you know, they love our voice. They love our experience. They don't publish manuals. And that was an interesting thing to get back because, of course, I really wanted this in manual form. Like, I want people to be able to use this book to get through the first Mm -hmm. year of witchcraft, you know, safely, well, empowered, and come out the other side as quite good mages. Um, And so I went, all right, fine. And I was sitting with the, you know, with this finished manuscript, and I happened to be talking to a friend who runs Dragon Alchemy Publishing. And I said, well, I've got this manuscript. And she said, well, send it to me. And that's how we ended up with Dragon Alchemy. And I'm just really grateful that the stars aligned on that because I wasn't really Mm -hmm. sure what to do next, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there are limited outlets for these types of books in the publishing world. I mean, there's the two big ones. Yep. There's a couple big ones in the UK. And, you know. And then that's it. Yeah. Yeah, And then you're like, where do you go? (laughs) Exactly. And it was actually really lovely to like work with a smaller publisher who's local. I think I've... I've always tried to have a very local and geographically centered focus to everything I do. So the thought that we're, oh, great, we're working with another local pagan. How great is that? It was kind of an accident, but this is our community. How wonderful. So I think it actually ended up working out like perfectly mm-hmm. for what we're trying to do in the world. Yeah. Do you feel like because you're working with a smaller publisher, you got a little bit more control? Like yes. getting to pick your release date. <laughs> yes, exactly. I, I have many friends who publish with uh, both Llewellyn and Weiser, and it, it, our process was a lot more transparent. Um, it was really wonderful to be able to have ongoing conversations about how the book looks. We had a lot of input in terms of it, you know, its appearance, which fonts are being used, the size of the captions on the images, like, and and our publisher has been awesome about all of that since Kane and I are both, you know, this is our baby. We're very excited and we want it to be right. <laughs> yes. Kane, what was your experience of all of that? Yeah, it, it was, it, I, you know, I, I don't want to, I don't want to drag any, anything through the mud, um, you know, but uh it, I, it was always my understanding when I would look at any pagan book on a bookshelf, I felt like I was looking at a manual, um, you know, so, and, and you would, you would read like the discussion and then they would give you stuff to do right to practice the tool. Um, so it was, it was an interesting, uh, it was an interesting process of being rejected uh, for, for being a little bit more obviously a manual um, than what all of the other manuals that are already on the shelf, uh, are doing, but, but no, in, in, in reality, like, I feel like, I feel like this worked out the way that it should have for all the same reasons why Irene just, just mentioned about staying local and, and staying within the community, you know, the, this black feather mystery and our band, um, you know, we, we do a lot to support and to stay connected with our local community. And the fact that, that this 
that the the school itself was birthed here uh and the book can also be born here uh and then spread out from here like that i think that's how it was supposed to be to be honest yeah i like i like that kind of encapsulation of it that that's nice um so now you have this the mystery school you're publishing books you have multiple musical projects. How do you both balance all of that kind of stuff day to day? Because I mean, you also <laughs> clearly Kane has a day job too. So, <laughs> coffee. <laughs> what balance? What is lots what is this balance? <laughs> lots of caffeine. No. Um, so. I am one of those weird critters that is literally a professional witch. It's what I do for a living, which allows me to concentrate effort in into this. Um, so I, some of why I'm answering some of the questions more is that, you know, Kane writes gorgeous classes and teaches these gorgeous classes. And then I do a lot of the back end stuff of like turning it into a book and emailing publishers da, 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 because, you know, he has a more structured job. Um, I'm really, really fortunate uh, in that I because I can take clients when I wish to, as opposed to on some businesses hours, I'm able to move things around a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Um, But in terms of balance, like I meditate every morning, I do pranayama every morning, I go out and hike a lot. I have two dogs that keep me sane. We go outside um, gardening. Uh, Gardening became even bigger for me during the pandemic than it had ever been before. I really feel that shovel therapy is a very real thing in this world. And of course, I see a therapist. Uh, I think Kane actually just graduated therapy, but he was with a therapist for a long time. Both of us very much practice what we preach. Like, you know, it takes a village. It really does. Yes, this is true. Yeah, uh, I and I not to t- get like super duper long with this story, but um, I we run the school out of a, a local UU church, and um, I remember years ago when I first started going to the church, uh, the Reverend Carl um, gave uh, was 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 talking about meditation, and he talked about how during times of stress, uh, he makes twice the amount of time for meditation as, as he does when life is normal. And he had somebody ask him like, how do you find the time to spend that much time doing self-care and taking care of yourself? And his response to that was, how can I not find the time to put that effort in to do the self-care, to do the work. Uh, And like Irene said, we have to practice what we preach, right? I'm a massage therapist. I basically teach self-care for a living to to people uh, on top of, you know, doing the the manual work that I do. Uh, And if I don't take care of myself, if I don't create balance, um, then, you know, none of this would have happened. I, I would have never been able to be a part of, the Black Feather Mystery School. I could never be in the band uh, because I would probably just be a, a like sh- a little wreck on the, in a ditch somewhere. <laughs> um, but yeah, like it, we just we have we 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 create balance. We we don't find it. We we make it. Well, and I think Kane and I both have the benefit of having come from some pretty fierce backgrounds, right? So I was in the Marines. Kane was a guard at a prison. Um, so we've both done the unhealthy lifestyle thing quite well uh, and learn some hard lessons. And one of the beautiful things about aging is you you begin to realize that, in fact, all of the old folks were right. You must take care of you. It's not a choice you have to. Otherwise, nothing else works. You know, as Kane yeah. said, the book wouldn't exist. The school wouldn't exist. The band wouldn't exist. Like, it's just stuff you got to do, like taking your vitamins and eating your vegetables. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, it's impossible, I think. I won't say impossible. I try never to say never. It's very difficult to be creative out of a place of burnout. And yes. you know, like two years of pandemic, the world is literally on fire. Personal stuff. Like in order to be a creative person, you have to make time and space for that. Like you said, came So Yeah, you do. And you have to rest as well. Like creatives need they need break spaces in order for those beautiful thoughts to percolate. And if there's not a break in the onslaught and there isn't in the way this Western world works to build them, you know. Accurate. Accurate. Healthy boundaries. (laughs) 
for the win. Yes. Yeah. Yay, yes. boundaries. <laughs> boundaries, yeah. Boundaries and wards, man. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> There's a reason the chapter on shielding is so long. <laughs> I know. I, um, it was kind of interesting to read this book as just read it straight through because that's not what it's for. So it was an interesting experience to kind of read through in that, you know, way of like, I want to read everything so I can talk to you about it. But I I did find myself really stopping in that chapter and kind of think, okay, maybe there's a couple of things I need to add here that I haven't been doing. So it was, it was nice to get a little reminder of like, oh, it might be time to tune those up. I would say that like, this is one of the benefits to going to people's classes. Like I, I, I sit on the board of sacred space conference. I've been teaching at festivals and conferences for years. I love going to other people's classes because even if it's material, I think I know there's usually something that I've gotten lazy about (laughs) or just it never occurred to me to consider it that way like you pick Mm -hmm. up these little glimmering diamonds you know when you've been on the path for a while it's not that everything ever gets to be new again but there's always a new way to turn the prism to catch Mm -hmm. a little bit of different light and one of the fun things about teaching of course is it makes you also sit down and think through what you do and go you know I could do this better I think I will do this better. Like there's, there are approaches here that are better than mine. (laughs) And, and I think that that's a beautiful thing about, about trying to create anything that's witchcraft based in the world is it makes you look at your own practice first and then improve it. And that's a great thing. You know, we're all always like trying to get to the center of the spiral. (laughs) Well, and I think the other thing from just, I mean, a, having a podcast where I talk to authors means I've got to up my reading game quite a bit. Um, oh my gosh, I can't even imagine. <laughs> but the thing that I've already picked up on, like one of my 15 episode, 15 recordings in, not, there's not that many episodes out, but probably 15, 16 recordings in, is that writers will talk about the exact same thing and that how they turn the prism also is how they turn the phrase. Like they'll talk about the exact same thing with totally different words different terminology and that in itself makes you look at it differently yeah just the choice of terminology absolutely just hearing somebody describe something in a way you haven't heard before Mm -hmm. I, i can't tell you how many useful analogies i've picked up from going to other people's workshops because it never occurred to me to think of you know an egregore as being a really good you know example of that being santa claus like of course, that's brilliant. That's a current one we can think of that it you know came mm-hmm. about in the 1950s and a hundred percent Santa Claus, like Coca-Cola Santa Claus, the, the one that's not the historical figure, he's real because kids believe in him. What a wonderful example of that. And yeah. you know, that's something I learned from somebody else. Like these are wonderful. It's it's always good to sit and and take somebody else's class. I always learn something. I have yet to have that be a waste of my time. Yeah. It, it reminds me one of the things I really enjoyed in the spirit work section was Kane your use of like Microsoft Windows and like a GUI <laughs> interface and all that to talk about yeah. how you do these things. I was like, that is so brilliant because it's something most people deal with every day in the most mundane way possible. But it totally makes it make sense when you're talking about something that's pretty esoteric and not easily put into words always. Yeah. And, and when, when, when you're talking about something that is that is so like nebulous uh as nebulous as as like leaving your body and traveling to a different space time and bringing knowledge and energy and information and things back and healing a person like like right right now if you tried to have that conversation with with like a a, a medical doctor like the, the, there are no real words to describe what we're doing so so i the and as as a as a kid who was raised like in that generation where we where where we were like real little when we started getting the first computers in our school like the that was the best way that i could relate what my experience of uh, of of what i'm doing when i'm healing someone uh and moving energy around of 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 just this like you know, the, the, there's a lot going on in the background uh, when, when you're, when you're throwing something in the recycling bin on, on, uh, windows desktop, there's a lot going on in the background when we're seeing these little like pop-ups and, and there's a bar filling up counting to a hundred. Like we think that we're just getting to a hundred, but in the, on the background, there's, there's so much happening. Uh, and it's kind of like that in, in journeys. And, and that's, that's why, 
uh, I talk a lot about how everything that we see in a journey is really just kind of our brain trying to process information and give us stuff that's relatable. So what we're seeing are, are avatars and icons um, and things like that happening. Uh, but but on the back end, we're, we're having a very energetic experience. Like it's all energy. Everything's just like static, like buzzing around and doing things and transferring back and forth. Uh, and our brain makes sense of that by creating images. Uh, and so that's, that's kind of the, the, how I ended up coming to that, um, that parallel between using a computer and, you know, doing past life reconciliation for somebody or, or soul retrieval or something like that, where, where that, that just kind of clicked for me. Well, it works. I mean, I'm a Mac person. I still got it. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, A, I hope a lot of people buy this book because I think it's great. I think, well, A, I think there's a need for more 101 books or entry level books to recommend to people. I mean, I, you know, came to then Wicca in the early 90s and you know, everybody was still reading Cunningham. I mean, that's, yeah, that's what was available. And, you know, I still have a soft spot from in my heart for Scott and probably always will. Um, I always think of him as kind of the Mr. Rogers of paganism. <laughs> oh my gosh. He totally is. No, I, some of the spells I have memorized, the ones that I can just rattle off, they're from earth, air, fire, and water. Like, mm-hmm. it's oh, okay. yeah. I mean, it like, was, these and, are our forebears. They're, they're lovely people. <laughs> yeah. But I do think a lot has changed. Like the way culturally we've changed the way we look at sexual orientation and gender and how that shows up in craft and all that has changed. I think new books are really important and I'm just excited to have more books to recommend to people who say, Oh, I really want to dip my toe in. And I'm like, well, I don't want to recommend you a 40 year old book. I want to recommend something new to you. Um, But so what are like the bigger goals with the books? Like I gather from what you've said, this is book one. Yes, a Black Feather Mystery School is envisaged is envisaged to be four four years of training. So there are ultimately the plan is for four books. Mm-hmm. Um, so the year the the season that we just wrapped up, wrapped up was Crow, um, and then the last one is Raven, which is basically um, elab not elaborate um, but more challenging material in terms of healing techniques, and then a lot around clergy work in the world. Like I'm, like I mentioned, I'm a professional witch. What that really looks like is minister stuff. Um, mm-hmm. So I do a lot of pastoral counseling. I do a lot of bedside work. I do a fair bit of death work. Um, and it's a lot of how to approach that part of the world. And then for Kane's side, of course, it's, you know, really deep levels of healing. Uh, so the goal, of course, is to be able to to end up with witches like us. The original challenge that was placed, uh, I was in a, a form of ritual called Sailor, which is a Norse divinatory form where a seer channels a deity or another being. And I basically was told, teach, make them like you. And so the entire concept behind Black Feather is, okay, could I deliberately condense my learning journey from the 20 years that it took down to four. And mm-hmm. so the goal ultimately is for these four levels, four books, and for us to just continue teaching them mm-hmm. and revise as times change. You know, we're going to find out things that shift and, you know, <laughs> everybody back in the 90s was using binary labels for things that have no reason to have a gender assigned to them. And we're unpacking that now, right? You know, it's one of those things where like, do yeah. we really need to refer to row? Is Mary as masculine, or can we just say fiery? Because I think fiery is what we actually mean. Like, there are going to be things that are in our blind spot now that'll change. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we do want this to be very much like a living school. It's a school, it's meant to be flexible. But yeah, the plan is four books, four years, continue playing in a band and live happily ever after. At least that's my plan. (laughs) What about you, Kane? What's your plan? Yeah. Uh, Well, first of all, I just, I I, want to. Uh, backtrack a little bit and and point out uh, just because I think that this is really important for me and my reasoning behind joining. Uh, so when 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 Irene says make them like you, or make them like her. Uh, I I hope all of the the listeners and I hope that everybody who doesn't know who know us yet uh, comes to understand as they read the book uh, and as they get to know us through our material that that 
what we're trying to do is is make people community leaders and healers. What is often problematic in the, or what has been often problematic in the past and remains problematic in the present is that you get these you get these covens and you and these group you know closed practitioner groups that become cults of personality. And it becomes more about the person leading the group than it than the group itself. And one of the things that was so important to me in joining this was that we what we are doing is is not telling people how to worship, but we're giving people tools for them to figure out their own path and to create a wholly unique healer or priest or priestess. Um, and and that that's one of the things that that is so important to me. And for my long term goals, is is that this is a a an an engine, if you will, that is going to or a factory that is going to crank out a whole new generation of healers and community leaders to help make this world that we live in an even better place because mm-hmm. it needs it. It needs healers. Yes. And and that's what we're trying to do when we're when we're making people like us, we're trying to make people who will benefit everyone around them. One of my favorite Orion Foxwood quotes is that when the world needs witches, she makes witches. And I'm one of the ones that believes there's a reason there are so many of us right now. Um, And one of the things that I observed just from teaching over the last 20 years is there's always this sense of gaps, you know, because we are not centralized. And like you said, there honestly, like there are there are better 101 books, but there aren't many that are that put it all in one place. And that's what we've been really trying to do with this one. And it's it's this idea that, okay, the world needed witches. And so now there's a lot of us. How do we make us stronger? How do we make us more effective? You know, how do we teach us to, you know, to support a cause, to rally a community? How do we teach us to heal, not just ourselves, but our community? How do we instill a sense of service? Uh, all of those things are really, really important. And I think it's vital for our community going forward. You know, it's easy to forget that there are people in this world that really don't want us to exist. I mean, there's a a new minister on the rise that just held like a witchcraft book style book burning. And that tidal wave needs something to crash against. And I would, you know, just assume that that if it hits us, we're ready for it, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was one of the things I really liked about the book is this idea of coming to like, understand your own power first, protect yourself, you know, care for yourself before you take that next step. I think a lot of young witches, I don't really like the term baby witch, so don't use it. Um, I think young witches, wherever they are, you know, young in their practice, not necessarily teenagers or 20 somethings, um, come to witchcraft first through spell work because it's the very visual part and social media and in all kinds of media, spell work seems to be the thing. And it's kind of like what you said earlier, Kane, about maybe learn something you shouldn't have first. And maybe that's when you have something like that blow up on you first. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. I see he's not the only one, too. I slammed my head against that wall real hard a couple times. Yeah. And and I, I was, was interviewed for another podcast a few months ago. And one of the questions she asked is like, what what do you wish you had known when you were younger? And, and mine was to be quiet about it. <laughs> You know, like that would have been a good thing for me to know. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, coming from that place where that minister who just burned books, that's where where I was from. So, you know, it's right. You said you're from Tennessee. That's a, yeah, that's a hard part of the world to be pagan in. Would have been smarter to be quiet about it. Mm. I think, you know, I, I like the approach. And I like coming from it from this angle that isn't we're going to do the flashy stuff first. We're going to do the important stuff first. Yeah, thank you. It, it, that was important to yeah. both of us. Yeah, we wanted a solid foundation in place before we got into the the smells and bells. <laughs> yes, I mean, I love the smells and bells, but I know me too, right? Hard yeah. saying, but, you know, I think what Kane and I both really love teaching is actually intermediate to advanced work, but we wanted a really solid foundation in place. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the first year training is as solid as we could possibly make it. Yeah. And a lot of it is based on all the stuff we did wrong. 
that's the best. I mean, that's the best way to teach, honestly, oh, yeah. is to have an example of, oh yeah, I did this wrong. Let me, let me tell you the story of my wrongness. <laughs> I mean, that's the stuff we couldn't really put in the books because it involves like other humans that we would have to get consent forms from. But if you come to a black feather class, you will get the dirt of like, oh, yeah, and here's why we do this this way. <laughs> uh, so how is the school working? So you're kind of going through like a cohort for four years that's or right. how will that work? So we'll, we'll start rotating. Um, this book is timed to coincide. So I want to make sure that it goes through to release correctly. And then during the summer, we're going to start up another magpie level, which is the first level, and then we'll run them tandem. Uh, mm -hmm. And part of working together to build the school is so that Kane and I can each teach all of it independently. So that depending upon our schedules and the needs of the community, we can always look at, you know, Kane can teach an entire level of Rook without me because we'll have gone through it and created it mm -hmm. together. Uh, so, you know, the, the plan is ultimately like as need demands. Um, there's a big waiting list for Magpie right now, which I'm really excited about. And one of the great things with the book is it allows us to have no geographical boundaries whatsoever. Right. So Magpie, the first time it ran, of course, was just in Frederick, Maryland. There were like 63 people that went through that training. Um, and it's so wonderful to be like, I can just, however many of you would like to come show up, you know, we can, yeah. we can, we can have a classroom the size of the planet. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's one tiny good thing that's come out of the pandemic, I think, is this idea that we can connect through time and space in much bigger ways than we did before. Yes. It doesn't have to be in person. Although I miss in person too. And I'm oh looking forward gosh. to more of that. Yes. So. We have our first, so yeah, like I mentioned, we're in a band. Kindred Crow is a pagan folk band. It was specifically designed to play pagan folk festivals. That's what we do. And uh, we finally have shows on the calendar yeah. for June and we are ourselves collectively <laughs> about being able to be in shared pagan community space and do shows and play music and teach the we're playing um the free spirit gathering and kane and i are both teaching and i'm helping lead a ritual and we're just going to do all of the things this year <laughs> oh that sounds great i have joked that i kind of think the first few times i've been out in the world it's like i feel kind of feral <laughs> like i've just forgotten how to be around people <laughs> so It'd be interesting to be in a crowd that big. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. So, uh, so kind of on the writing side of things, like I always ask the folks on the show, I say that like this is a thousand year old tradition, but I'm just going to say it that way. Um, <laughs> like for you, like for writing, what is a perfect writing day look like for you? Do you have rituals around how you write? Do, do you, are you precious about it? Or is it just like, no, I have this 15 minutes of scrap a time. I'm going to write what I need to write. I've been talking a lot. Kane, why don't you start? Oh, man. Um, so, so I have, I have my, like, uh, my, my, my optimal day. And then I have, all of the other days. So my optimal day of writing uh, is me being able to sit down at the computer, throw on some headphones, and I listen to music that is the specific mood that I am trying to convey when I write. Uh, and I just blare it in my ears and type away. Uh, that's my optimal day. Uh, on most of the other days, uh, I'm literally either voice texting it while I'm like folding laundry, uh, or doing dishes or whatever, um, or, or like in between clients and I had a, I had a no show and I've got an extra 30 minutes <laughs> to sit down and like crank out another paragraph um, of, you know, for the, for the upcoming class. Uh, so yeah, I mean, when I can, I, my ritual is listening to music. Uh, you know, that's uh, music is, is as much a, a part of my life as, as writing ever, ever has been. I, I live and breathe music. So, uh, I think it's a, it's an extremely powerful, um, altering device, uh, which is, which is why I fell into journeying so, so easily and so quickly, uh, using rhythm. Um, so using music to kind of keep me where I want to be puts me in the zone. And then I just like grind through and it's great. 
Yeah, I, I listen to music when I write too. I can't really imagine not listening to music while I write. For that reason, it's, it's a mood. It sets the mood and the tone. Yeah. Yeah. Um, for my part, uh, I'm a, I'm one of those horrible morning people. Um, <laughs> my my clearest hours of the day are between like 6 a.m. and noon. So I, I actually do write a lot for a living. I write a weekly blog and I have a column in a local newspaper and things like that. Um, so I, my the way my schedule works is I have writing hours earlier in the day and then I see clients in the afternoon. My brain is still fully functional, but I've lost some of my creative juices by then. So uh, for me, it's, you know, cup of coffee sitting down in my beautiful, quiet little office and being able to just really zoom in on the material. Um, I do have a spell that has been running and will continue to run during the creation of the book that was all about bringing the book to, you know, to fruition, just reaching above my desk right here. So there's a specific candle that I burn when I'm working on black feather things that, you know, uh, will then the sigil, the sigil on it gets transcribed to a new candle when that one burns down. I don't want to make it sound like super precious and ritually though. It's literally like I lean forward and light the candle and then I like get into my laptop space <laughs> and one of the things that is funny about me is I require quiet. So you two both love music. I can't have it going while I'm working. Although if I get into my zone, I don't hear a damn thing. And that may be why I don't play music because I do like that tunnel vision thing. Like mm -hmm. I'll disappear into something I'm working on. And then suddenly it's six hours later and I don't know what happened. So like that's, that's my writing groove. So for me, it's quiet and it's my early hours of the day. Yeah. Optimum, I'm in front of my computer by 7.30 and that'll be a good day. Nice. I saw Kane's face when you said you're one of those morning people, and I was like, "Oh, I feel you. I'm not." <laughs> I'm, a, I'm, I'm a so late sorry. Morning, I'm a late morning person, is what I tell people. I like to write between like nine and noon. That's my sweet spot. <laughs> yeah, I, I often describe the hours that Irene wakes up as offensive. <laughs> yes, <That's>... yes, he <laughs> This is the military. They like hammer that into you. I can yeah, but some that. of it's also natural. <laughs> like my in my family, my mother and my sister are night owls. My sister's a professional actress. It's a good fit because she doesn't get home until two in the damn morning sometimes. Mm -hmm. And my father and I were morning people. So even as a child and as a teenager, and teenagers are supposed to be vampires. Like they're supposed to be borderline nocturnal. <laughs> and I was still like, even then I was sleeping in was like eight. I'm just like this. And unfortunately, there's nothing I can do about it. <laughs> but it's Kane nature. has the late hours handled so <laughs> yeah I, I have fought most of my life and tried to be a morning person because I thought that was the correct way to be and finally like approaching 50 I'm like you know what no I'm a night person and that's how it is and that's how it's gonna be <laughs> unfortunately I'm married to a morning person so oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> My spouse and I are both are both morning people. I mean, the thing is, though, there's a very good reason that we're all different. We're supposed to be. If you look at it from a tribal point of view, like this was so that there was always somebody awake and able to think clearly no matter what hour of the day of night it was or the, the of the day or night it was, you know, this protects yeah. the community. So it's good that we're all different and I will happily yeah. handle the dawn and you can all take care of midnight. Sounds good. I'm more like, what is the thing? Are you a morning lark or a night owl? I'm like, no, I'm in the middle. I'm an exhausted pigeon. I love that meme. <laughs> yes. I, right now I feel like I'm kind of in the exhausted pigeon stage, but um, cause I, my day job requires my morning hours right now. So hopefully at some point that won't be true, but um, it's like, I'd like to get that creative yeah, my, time back. My goal for mornings is to survive them. That's, that's, that that, that's my, that's my morning. It, it yeah. gets be it's get up and get myself functional, uh, sometime before like 10. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's all, when, I don't, I don't start, I don't start seeing clients until, uh, 10 o'clock on my mm -hmm. earliest days. Like there's just no freaking way that, yeah. that I, I, I spend the, the first two or three hours of every day, just like trying to get myself able to be around people 
So how does that work when you perform? I mean, I guess festivals, it isn't always late night, but a lot of times it can be late night performing. It's not too bad. Um, So Kindred Crow as a a folk project and as one that does specifically play pagan festivals, the latest we go on stage is like nine or 10. Mm -hmm. And those are just nights where we're up a little later. I will say at festivals though, like the the last crow to the the morning breakfast table is Kane. Like (laughs) universally, (laughs) there are five of these last. You know your role. That's the important thing. Nope. Yeah, and, and festivals are, they're also, fun. I don't think any of us go to the festival circuit or like attend pagan conferences with the intention of getting a lot of sleep. At least I certainly don't. So those are ones where I'm like, this is fine. I'm just going to stay up till one o'clock in the morning and then get up at six anyway and teach a yoga class. It'd be all right. I'll sleep when I'm dead. Like, and that's what I mean by the, like the coffee joke. Like I'm only partially kidding. Some of, <laughs> some of this is just me white knuckling my way through life. <laughs> So I am fueled on caffeine. I actually broke today. I tried not to drink caffeine afternoon, but I was like, no, I desperately need caffeine. So I went for tea instead of coffee in a somewhat compromised. Hey, there you go. Yeah. It's still caffeine. Yep. And I don't know. Decaffeinated. Helps. What is that? <laughs> Suffering. I think it's what decaffeinated That's, is. That is, that is really true. <laughs> so in writing the book, did either of you find, um, like in teaching the classes, I guess the way this works, teaching the classes and writing the book, did it change your own practice or deepen your own practice in the middle of this? Because you're pretty, you know, I guess, absorbed in this. Kane, I've been, yeah, I've been talking absolutely. a lot. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, a hundred percent. You know, and, and, and also, I, I Irene's right that it is, it's a lot more fun to teach like the uh, the intermediate to advanced stuff. Um, but teaching the first year of, of Black Feather was also, I felt really like beneficial to myself uh, in kind of forcing me to remember the basics uh, and and to remember all of the basics that I that 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 I should be doing on a daily basis. And, and, and it was, it it was, it was a really great opportunity, um, to, to kind of go back to my roots, uh, in, in, in a way and, and almost like rebuild my own practice because like I said, this was the first time that, that I was going to distill my whole practice into like something comprehensive, uh, and, and with like a logical progression through it. Um, so by being forced to do that, it forced me to kind of restart my own practice and my own spiritual path, uh, which was just an absolutely beautiful experience. And at, it was at the end of our first year during our, um, our closing ritual where I publicly claimed my name of Kane Dreamwalker. Yeah. And he didn't tell me he was going to do that either. It was really cool. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) No. And for my part, that is true as well. Uh, really accomplished which um so i was allowed to cross train into fairly advanced spirit work without having had to go through the previous years of training that many people do because much of witchcraft is comparable and what was so valuable about the first year of black feather about the magpie training was all of kane's material for me because i didn't do the beginning level spirit work that was all new for me and it was really wonderful to learn it in a more structured way and to have a more coherent way to talk about it. I Mm. knew that, you know, for Blackfeather, I wanted to teach spirit work and witchcraft at the same time, because I wish I'd learned spirit work in the beginning. You know, I only picked it up during the last five years and it would have been so great to have that tool set a long time ago. And It was really, you know, it was something that I really wanted, but as a fairly new spirit worker, I didn't feel confident to teach it. I only teach material that I really know and that I've, you know, I've tested myself for a long time. So that's part of why having Kane on board was so important. And I just got so much out of his classes of like, oh, this is all the, okay, I found the foundation. Awesome. These are the fundamentals that I had missed. Fantastic. I'm adding these. And it's just (laughs) been really, you know, I think we've both enjoyed like, being subject to each other's teaching, basically. <laughs> and that makes yeah, sense. That, that's one of my that's one of my favorite parts about this whole project uh, is the diversity that we share. 
between the two of us because you know and I, Irene and I joke often with each other that we that that we share the same brain stem uh, be, because uh, we, we are so frequently just on the same page about a lot of things and a lot of uh, you know just it's, and it, it, a lot of it's important stuff too where like we'll it have, have what probably in a lot of cases would have been a longer conversation for other people it's like a five word exchange between us and we're both just like oh yeah okay we're both there we're on that we're, we're on the same page there which is great um but we come from such extremely different spiritual paths as a, for our background where where hers was the far more structured like witchcraft uh and mine was the like body covered in dirt dancing naked around a fire in the woods kind of kind of stuff uh where it, it it was it was so cool uh and still is every every year is great uh to 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 not just not just teach my own stuff but to experience hers and and then twist that it, it, along with the uh with our students get that experience of blending those two different paths into one new like beautiful and amazing experience yeah i think that some of my favorite the favorite sort of sections of the book are ones where kane and i are contributing equally um mm -hmm. because the the different perspectives and ways of solving problems and experiences i think make for a much more well-rounded uh text and a much more well-rounded class and i think that that's really some of the strength of, of our particular uh way of being in the world is is the collaboration behind it and the fact that we're not the same you know we don't come from the same tradition at all and that's a really good thing mm -hmm. and i like the way yeah, your voices you play in the book oh go ahead kane sorry uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, people, I was just going to say, people will get the opportunity the the further into this co these courses that that they get, where um, Irene and I in the beginning, I'm sure you, you noticed, like like each each section, it'll say like that your instructor is Irene here, your instructor is Kane here, uh, and in Magpie it was very much like that. But the further in that we've gotten, the the uh, the more uh, like uh, the more that we've both contributed to each individual class to the point where where by the end of this third year we were, we were having to work off of the same google doc in a lot of instances uh because we were both writing one class together uh so 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 you see you'll get to see more of that blend of our two different perspectives mm -hmm. the further along you get where we kind of started off by te by teaching the basics of each path and then Further on in the in, in in the mystery school, we teach how that how those two different paths come together, and we teach that together, and it's really great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, your voice has blend so well in the first book, even though it's clear, you know, lesson to lesson, this is your instructor. Like it, you know, it's two people, but it feels very unified, even oh, in in that. You. So, like, your writing styles are a little different, but not. Jar jarringly so like it's it just i'm feels glad scary. it's not jarring <laughs> yeah and reading it straight through i mean i don't know that most people are going to read it that way to just read you know cover to cover but it was it was nice to kind of see i don't know i just like the collaborative approach of weaving those voices together that was it was nice to see in the book oh thanks yeah it was it was fun to to do i mean you know we, we love black feather it's been a wonderful experience <laughs> so i have to ask did the band name with crow and it happen before the Corvid theme for the classes? Yeah. So my um, my spouse and I, my beloved Ash, uh, we met in a metal band um, and we got together and the metal band ended and we were just, just they and I playing, you know, just them on guitar and me doing vocals and drums. And we had done some music for our congregation, the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Frederick that Kane was referencing earlier where Black Feather is taught out. And for anybody who's playing along at home, you know, Unitarian Universalists share values rather than beliefs. So it's like this wonderful open house of people who value the search for spiritual truth. And so you can have a pagan and a Buddhist and a Christian all sitting together and everybody's cool. And it's just a really cool environment. But we were, <laughs> we were walking home from having done that. And we were still figuring out what to call ourselves. We knew we wanted to do folk music. Metal gets harder as you get older. Like, I am not here to get on stage at two o'clock in the morning anymore. I am 41 years old. It is not, this is not a thing I'm doing now. <laughs> 
were walking in the front door of our apartment building and it was a big glass door. And as per usual, Ash and I were both wearing all black and they looked at me and they said, you know, you and I wander around looking like a couple of crows. (laughs) And that's where that started. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so then we were like, well, what should we call the, the band? Something with crow in it. And we wanted the band to be, to be, to feel like family, to call people of like mind together. And the word kindred was a really good fit for that. Mm-hmm. And here's the funny thing is if you name something in your life after crows, uh, just for anybody who ever wants to work with the crow egregore, it's a little bit like getting mugged and then waking up covered in black feathers in an alley. All of a sudden, (laughs) it's all crow and corvid stuff everywhere. You should see my house, Victoria. It's covered in crow stuff. And that wasn't even like a thing. But now it is. (laughs) And, you know, Kane, my crow brother, and I sort of came up with the idea for black feather. We all always knew it had to have a reference to the Corvid family. We named the levels after Corvids. So mm-hmm. it just, it just, if you start working with Crow or Raven or Rook or, you know, any of them, just beware, like <laughs> it becomes viral. <laughs> the, so I'm in Silicon Valley and Sunnyvale was actually in the national news pretty recently because the Crows have started congregating downtown. They, you know, opened the streets for restaurants to eat outside during and and then the fires i guess brought them into the populated areas so they just had this massing of crows every night that was making it i think deeply unpleasant for people to eat outside oh, wow. so now that you know they're trying to find ways to get them not to congregate because i was like i really would like to make crow friends but i'm pretty sure my neighbors would kill me <laughs> <laughs> mischievous yes <laughs> um, it's like oh there's so many here because i always thought oh we'd move to california seagulls everywhere which we do see and that's a bird i've always kind of associated with but the crows are here too and i love it so i'm just probably not in the majority <laughs> i yes i would say that being descended like having a horde of corvids of any kind descend upon a town is probably really upsetting for a lot of people <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's a very clever family of bird <laughs> yes definitely so before we get to the last question which is our tiny game of chance at the end um I wanted you guys to have an opportunity to tell people where they can find you, like where are you going to be? This episode will air a little bit after we talk. So think of like late summer, maybe fall stuff. Okay. And uh, So blackfeathermystery.com is a really great place to find out all things book and all things training courses. Um, both Kane and I are also, of course, you know, in music. So kindredcrow.com is a great place to find us if you're looking for the musical side of our work. Um, there will be a magpie course running. There will be subsequent courses that run. Um, we do plan to appear at the Frederick Pagan Pride Day, both as musicians uh, and um, as teachers, and that will be in September. Um, and then I am usually at Earth Spirits Twilight covening up in Massachusetts uh, in October. That's one of my favorite retreats of the year. Uh, And uh, the easiest way to find me specifically is glasswitchcottage.com. That has all of the classes that I teach, my weekly blog, references to Black Feather. It's where part of my witch world and it's uh, glass with an E. So, you know, it's Gaelic. Everything's got silent letters, (laughs) but glasswitchcottage.com finds me very, very easily. But you can. Um, well, I'm, I'm pretty well attached to Irene everywhere, except, for, <laughs> except for glass, Witch. so yeah, uh, black feather mystery, uh, school has a little website that, that people can go to. We have our Facebook group. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure the more books, the more like we're, we're super close to releasing the book. So we've got a ton of like, we've got of, of promo material that's like, hanging out waiting to be released into the world like a like a murder of crows um and i'm 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 sure that that will that more of that will end up on the website and and so between the band and the school uh you can definitely find uh you know find all kinds of my stuff uh on either of those places Uh, and kane brings up a good point uh, i I was just going to say i'm not as as social media savvy as as irene is uh um but uh, I do exist in social media if you, if you hunt me down hard enough. <laughs> <laughs> the 
that's one of the sides of the school that I handle more than Kane. And but Kane reminded me of it. We are absolutely on social media. You can find us on Facebook. There's a page. There are groups for each level of the school. Um, so just come track us down. If you search for Black Feather Mystery School, you will find us. All right. And we'll put links in the show notes for folks too. Thank you. So they can find it a little bit easier. Show notes aren't always great on all platforms, but they can go to our website too and they'll be in there for the show notes. Um, awesome. So for the last question, I'm going to, and I think I'm going to ask you both the same question. I thought maybe I'd roll it twice, but I think I'm going to ask you about the same question. So I'm going to roll the die and depending on if I get a one, you know, two, it'll be death, sex, religion, politics, money, or Ooh. if I roll a six, you get to pick which one you like. <laughs> You'll have to confer if, I, if we roll a six. And I'm tempted if it's a four to roll again because the last three guests have gotten a four. And I have a new die, so hopefully that won't happen. Three, religion. Not that we haven't really been talking about that the whole time, but more, more pointed question um, for the two of you, since I don't think that we get to decide for the whole giant pagan umbrella and things that fall right outside of it. Um, is witchcraft for you a practice or a religion? Or both. So for me, it's a practice. Paganism is a religion to me. Witchcraft is an art and a science. What about you, Kane? Um, are, are, are we speaking about witchcraft specifically or my path specifically? Witchcraft. 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 You can talk about your path, though, after you answer the first question. <laughs> sure. Um, no, I, 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 I would consider witchcraft. To, to be a practice um, that any craft, you know, arts and crafts, you know, uh, that that's a that, that is a practice. That witchcraft is a is a set of tools um, and 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 guidelines. Uh, a religion has uh, typically a, a, a more um, definable name or notable name, rather. Uh, it, in terms of my own. Uh, in spirit work, uh, I, I, and, and, and my spiritual path, uh, I, I liken my entire spiritual path and my entire existence really, um, to this like kind of long and, and overblown metaphor that I like to, to soapbox about, especially after too much mead, um, where, uh, I, I view my entire experience of life as a walk through the woods, uh, a very dense wood, and and everything that that I get to experience spiritually is another step on this this path through the woods toward whatever, toward my next life, maybe. And sometimes walking through that uh, through that forest. You know, you might come across a campfire where there are some other like-minded people sitting around on their path, uh, and you get to sit down and you get to experience, you know, these other people. And and maybe sometimes in the morning after that campfire goes out, they've all dispersed and they've gone on their own way. Or maybe sometimes you find people, you know, like I found with with Irene and Ash in the band, where where you all get up in the morning and you're still at the fire and you keep walking along the same path near each other. But even though you're near each other, each step is unique or step and and you can't walk the same path because otherwise you'd all be sitting on each other's shoulders. And and all of this is is really just me being really too wordy to say that I believe that all spirituality should be a unique walk down a path that that we can share by way of talking with each other. And we can even share by way of watching the next person beside us, but it is our path to walk and no one else's to, to claim. Um, and, and so I, I consider spirituality as a whole, a path rather mm -hmm. than a craft or a religion. It's a, it's a journey. I like that. I'm glad we got that one. Cause that's the, I don't yeah, think we would have gotten was, here from that. That's good the way you turned that. I like that. Good job, Kane. See, Kane's really Kane's good with words. <laughs> we have a running joke in Kindred Crow that Kane is our moral authority. And some of that is funny, but honestly, 
when the band is going through hard stuff and the band has gone through some hard things, Kane's usually the one that is able to put it all into words for the rest of us and like like really encapsulate what we all are trying to explain. So <laughs> Kane, the moral authority. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Oh, cool. Well, thank you both so much for being on the show. I'm so glad we got to talk this. I'm glad I got a sneak peek at your book and the gorgeous cover for I'm so it is lovely. About that cover. Um, so yeah, thank you both. And hopefully thank when the next you. book comes out, we'll have you back on and we'll talk about more stuff. Yay. Thank you so much for having us, Victoria. This was a pleasure. Yeah. Thank you so much. This, this has been great. Witch Lit is a production of Thousand Volt Press and is edited by Kaifel Agostini, who also designed our logo. Our music is Voices, composed for us by Alexander Shnekar. You can support our work, get early access to episodes, ask your own death, sex, religion, politics, money questions, and get some free stuff by joining our Patreon at patreon.com slash witchlitpod. Transcripts and all our previous episodes are available at witchlitpod.com. And you can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at witchlitpod. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and consider giving us a rating or review wherever you listen to podcasts. It helps other witches find the show. Thanks for listening and for reading Witchy.